Thank you, everyone. It's uh, brilliant to be here today. So every year globally, zoonotic uh, pathogens cause billions of cases of illness and millions of deaths in humans. And of those zoonotic pathogens, emerging zoonotic viruses are most likely to cause explosive outbreaks of severe disease. So how do we reduce the harm associated with those pathogens? So in an ideal world, what we really want to be doing is reducing the chance of these spillovers. And if we can't do that, uh, intervening at an early enough stage in that process of spillover to interrupt transmission chains between humans before they can become explosive outbreaks like the, the recent pandemic. So specifically, we want to be focusing our efforts on these highlighted blue stages. And we want to know which factors alter where, when, and how fast zoonotic viruses spread in animals and in the humans uh, that they cause these immediate spillovers to. Now, how do we go about doing that? To illustrate my point, I want to take you back to southeastern Brazil a couple of years ago in 2019. And this uh, image nicely illustrates what we see in that region. What we have is these global megacities, you know, places like Rio de Janeiro, that are in very, very close proximity to uh, highly biodiverse uh, forested regions. So here we have the Atlantic Forest, which despite um, massive population growth and land use change in the region, uh, contains about 5% of the wild vertebrate species that we see globally. So huge populations, very diverse uh, forests, massive land use change. These are the regions in which we see um, high risk of zoonotic virus emergence. And it was in this context in 2016 that we saw the emergence of a new outbreak of yellow fever virus. Now, yellow fever virus is endemic in South America, and we've long known that it's a zoonotic pathogen. So in South America, yellow fever virus spreads uh, between these non-human primates and uh, jungle-dwelling mosquitoes that live in forested areas. And human cases tend to be direct spillovers from that sylvatic cycle. Now, in this respect, the outbreak wasn't surprising. What was surprising was the areas in which we were seeing these, these new outbreaks of yellow fever virus we started to see expansion into coastal areas of Brazil that had been previously thought to be free of yellow fever virus. So as well as that location, we suddenly saw, you know, this outbreak was orders of magnitude larger than we'd seen in Brazil in the past six decades. So what we really needed to know was why, you know, what is it about this virus, um, how is it that this virus is spreading that appears to be um, uh, associated with these emergence in new regions? So to answer that question, um, we um, formed a partnership with different institutions uh, across the southeast of Brazil, situated in Belo Horizonte, Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, in the three largest cities in this most affected area of Brazil. So working with these partners, um, these different institutes receive diagnostic samples from patients and from uh, dead non-human primates in Brazil. So we could take these minine approaches, move them to these different laboratories in Brazil, and have a really well-distributed system focusing on sequences, uh, sequencing the yellow fever virus cases that were identified. So the approach that we used was coordinated between these different institutions. And this was a minine and Arctic multiplex PCR-based approach, which was ideal for many zoonotic viruses. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because Kami's kindly told us about the methods, but this is a, um, a multiplex approach in which we generate amplicons that span the entire genome of yellow fever virus. And this approach is perfect for yellow fever virus because in yellow fever outbreaks, we tend to see relatively low genetic diversity within the animal reservoir. So you can see here that our outbreak clade uh, on the bottom left, um, highlighted in red, is actually relatively, you know, it's monophyletic. We don't have a lot of, of diversity there that we're trying to capture. And this makes it really easy to design um, PCR primers that will allow us to amplify the whole of that genome. And this is true for many different zoonotic viruses. You know, we might see low diversity in the animal reservoir, or we might see, you know, a small um, series of human-to-human -human transmission that has been caused by one specific spillover. So again, we have a relatively uh, monophyletic outbreak that we might want to capture. Now, the other really nice thing about this method for zoonotic viruses is that it's really robust uh, to use on different tissue types from a wide variety of different species. So in this study, we had, I think, seven different species of non-human primate, three different species of mosquitoes, human samples. We had tissue types, serum, urine, all the kinds of stuff. 
This approach works really well on everything you can throw at it for yellow fever virus. So you can see in this scatter plot here that we could generate whole virus genomes uh, from tissue for PCR CTs up to about 20, and from urine and serum for PCR CTs up to about 30. So really robust, really quick, and really cheap. On the right, you can see our sequencing in action. So this is sequencing using the Rampart interface that was developed by James Hadfield uh, and the Arctic Network. And this is, I mean, this was a good run, but this is 10 minutes into the run. And you can see that we have really good genomes. Uh, you see the, the coverage of the reads mapping against our reference genomes. You can see that we're obtaining quite good coverage. Um, and this allows us to generate phylogenetic trees that allow us to very quickly answer questions such as, you know, how the non-human primate cases and the human cases are related to each other really rapidly during these runs. The other advantage of this approach um, is that we can stop the run immediately as soon as we've attained enough coverage for our genomes. And this means that we can wash the flow cells, add another library, and keep sequencing to as low cost as possible. So with these approaches, we can achieve uh, one of the things that Rosemary highlighted was important for um, emerging viral outbreaks, which is that it needs to be uh, deployable, distributed across different laboratories, cheap and easy. So with these coordinated efforts, working with different partners, we managed to generate virus genomes from 15% of confirmed infections in both humans and non-human primates. So this is 500 genomes generated here, which might not seem a lot, but this actually triples the number of genomes available from this um, genotype of yellow fever virus in South America. So 15% of confirmed infections is actually really high in terms of um, the, the proportion of uh, confirmed infections sequenced from wild animal reservoirs. Uh, it's astonishing for a zoonotic virus, and it's actually comparable to the, the best um, uh, genomic representation that we see in the most well-studied outbreaks of SARS-CoV-2 and of Ebola. So through this, we managed to achieve really good representativity, um, including um, throughout the, the whole of the affected area of Brazil, um, but also throughout time, so including in later uh, outbreak phases. This representativity is important because it allows us to use phylogenomic methods to study the factors that influence the spread of these diseases. So on the left, you can see um, the phylogenetic tree that's been kind of projected into real space and time. And this is snapshots showing where the outbreak has reached at these different time points. What you can see is these different branches, um, where the branches represent the um, uh, phylogenetically inferred um, routes of spread between different locations. What's immediately clear is that most of these um, uh, jumps are occurring over very short distances. The virus is tending to move between closely located um, uh, locations and with only these rarer long distance branches where we get long distance movements. But we can go further than that. If you look at this base map, you can see that it's got different colors of green there, and those represent the different um, ecoregions, the different kind of environmental uh, assemblages through which this virus is moving. And we can statistically show that the virus tends to move through the same ecoregion. Once it's in these moist, broadly forests, it tends to remain in them, even if the distance that it travels is longer than perhaps what we would infer as, as taking the direct route across the, the, the shorter distance across grasslands. So the virus is tending to avoid switching ecoregions. We can look at different factors of the rates of virus spread. So we showed that the virus was tending to spread slower in colder regions. And you can see this raster of the different colder and warmer regions in that part of Brazil on the right. So the virus is spreading slower in colder, higher elevation regions of the, um, the country. Now, one of the reasons that we think, uh, one of the factors that we think might explain this, we can also infer from virus genomes. So uh, on the left, you can see um, we've compared a number of different uh, seasonally varium predictors to see how these predictors, um, which of these predictors best predict the change in virus effective population size of yellow fever virus, which is kind of a proxy for outbreak size. So of the climatic variables that we looked at, temperature was the best predictor of virus effective population size. So perhaps these viruses are spreading um, slower um, in regions where we have kind of uh, less um, extensive outbreak in these wild animal reservoirs. Now, where it gets really interesting is where we start to look um, at how these different temperatures are associated with different virus evolutionary rates. 
So again, we've done some analysis that suggests that um, when we get virus moving through, um, uh, when we get periods of time um, where we get kind of low transmission periods which tend to be colder, we actually see a reduction in the rate at which the virus evolves during those time periods. And that can tell us something about how the virus is persisting. So we can see that um, it's been hypothesized that the virus will persist in mosquito eggs over time. So you get mosquito <coughs> eggs being produced containing this virus. And we think that probably this factor where we see a lower evolutionary virus rate in these colder periods with less transmission is a factor of um, this virus being um, maintained without replication in these mosquito eggs. So in summary, um, we can use relatively small amounts of virus genomes from uh, wild and spillover cases to really understand what it is that's driving this spread. We can link climatic and landscape variables with the dynamics of yellow fever virus. Now, more generally, explaining virus spread in animal populations and zoonotic reservoirs requires these low-cost, scalable genomic technologies that can be easily deployed in a distributed fashion close to where these infections occur. So what I want to leave you with is this thought of that, you know, for yellow fever virus, we have 2,000 genetic sequences. For SARS-CoV-2, we've got 13 million. How can we move some of these techniques, this growth in genomic sequencing that's been developed for SARS-CoV-2, to actually learn a lot more about zoonotic viruses in wild animals before they cause these kinds of pandemics? And with that, um, I would like to thank many of my colleagues. As you can see, these distributed methods require um, very large collaborations. You know, we get these distributed author sets. So I'd like to thank all of our different colleagues um, in Brazil. And if you'd like to learn more, please do um, come and read our paper on MedArchive. Um, so I will leave it there. And thank you very much.